quite small, fast reconnaissance vehicles like this one to go ahead of the main force and report information back. Now this particular vehicle going around now, this is something called the Ferret Scout car and it was made for the British Army just after the Second World War. You can see in World War II the British Army had a very, very successful vehicle called the Dingo. It's like a little armoured open top sports car. Very quick, it actually had a Daimler sports car engine in the back of it. Um, it could whip around the battlefield. Speed, don't forget, is a defence in itself. The quicker you are, the less chance the enemy are going to have to train their guns on you and knock you out. Now the ferret, ferret was developed from the dingo. This time it's got a turret on the top with a machine gun in. And really that machine gun is only there for a bit of moral support for the crew. If you bump into the enemy, quick burst of machine gun fire, and you back off quick. You're not there for fighting the enemy, that's for the tanks coming up behind you. You're there for finding out where the enemy are and what's the best way of getting at them. And this vehicle they actually gave it five reverse gears as well as five forward gears so it could get out of trouble quick. Because you imagine all these little narrow lanes just uh, around here in Dorset, imagine meeting an enemy tank coming the other way. The last thing you want to be doing is faffing around doing a three-point turn in the middle of the road. So what the driver can do, he just whacks it into reverse and he can go just as fast backwards as he can forwards. So commander's in the top with the machine gun, he's got the binoculars, he's got the radio, he's telling the force commander what's going on. Driver's down the front, you can see he's got his hatches open at the moment. Uh, if he comes under fire at all, he closes those hatches down and he looks out at glass periscopes. Now you can look through some of those glass periscopes in the museum. The whole idea, of course, if a bullet or something from a shell hits the glass, it may crack it, but nothing comes inside the vehicle to wound the driver or crew members or damage the vehicle at all. They have quick release buttons on the side, out goes the old periscope, in goes the new one, and off you go again. When you look through those periscopes, it's like looking at the world through a glass fish tank. It tends to distort the outside world. So that's why you'll often see drivers and vehicle commanders with their heads out the hatches till the last possible moment when they're going into action so they've got that sense of what's going on outside. The truth is most armoured vehicles close down, visibility is pretty appalling. In some modern vehicles they're even putting video cameras around the outside of the vehicles so the guys inside know a little bit more about what's going on outside. All the things on the ferret you'd expect to see on armoured vehicles Lots of them in the museum, just like this, where they've got things like tow ropes, pickaxes, a bit of canvas to make a lean-to shelter, cooker on the back, so you can uh, make your hot food, hot drinks, very important for morale. Um, other things on this vehicle, like you see in the museum, these stubby little tubes on the front. You see them on turret sides, sometimes on front fenders. Each of those tubes is what's called a smoke discharger. And if the vehicle comes under attack, Driver or commander can press a button, out flies a smoke grenade about the size of a coke can and a nice big smoke screen builds up in front of the vehicle very, very quickly. And that you can hide behind to back off quick and get out of trouble. Now Bobbington is the centre for the Royal Armoured Corps. This is where all the training goes on all the time. So around the roads here, you'll see vehicles. That's a Challenger 2 driver training tank doing its uh, driving instruction. Do remember, if you do come across vehicles driving around, they'll have a little red learner stick on the back, just like you have the back of your car when you were learning to drive. Please give them plenty of room. Driver in the front can see diddly squat, and if he turns left or right, you decide to overtake. Not a good idea. Now you can see the ferret is quite a nippy little vehicle. It can go up to about 55 miles an hour on the open road. Wheeled, wheeled vehicles tend to be quieter than tracks, but they can't go to the same places that a track vehicle can get to. So there's often a debate in the military, what do we want as a reconnaissance vehicle, wheels or tracks? At the moment, the British Army actually has a track reconnaissance vehicle, not a wheeled one. Right, next vehicle we're going to look at. This one you can see, we might, uh, some people might call it a tank. It's obviously not a tank, even though anything with tracks, we have a tendency to call them tanks. This one is what the military would call an APC, or an Armoured Personnel Carrier. Now, if you've seen our First World War trench display, 
you can see in there the whole idea of the first tanks, they're like battery rams. They go forward across the battlefield, they crush down the barbed wire, and let our soldiers come off behind them without getting held up by the enemy. Now, by the Second World War, tanks are doing many more things on the battlefield, and they're doing them much faster. So, for example, you'll see in the Second World War, the Germans and the Americans start making half-track vehicles to put the soldiers in the back of, so they can keep up with the tanks going forward into action. Now, when this vehicle was designed in the 1960s, pretty much every country that built a tank built a box on tracks like this one for carrying the soldiers forward into action. This one was made for the British Army, it's called an FV Fighting Vehicle 432, and in the back, they're going to give you a wave now, we've got some volunteers out the audience, and they're going to stand up, and then you're up, there they are, and give you a wave. And uh, we got them a little bit earlier on today out of the audience and we've given them a helmet, we've given them a gun and a uniform and they're going to show us a bit later in our display how a vehicle like this might be used in a combat situation. Now on the 432, designed for the British Army, still in service with the British Army today. Um, if you think of cars from the 60s, not an awful lot of cars apart from classic ones for um, social use or special events or something or other, very little vehicles, or very few vehicles from that era are still actually doing their day job. And that's because with armoured vehicles, they cost a lot of money, and what they tend to do is they send them back to the factory to rebuild them, rather than scrapping them entirely. So uh, some of the young soldiers training here at Bobbington, uh, they're actually half the age of the vehicles they're driving around in. Driver's at the front, he's got the square hatch, you can see his head out, he sits next to the engine, commander sits behind him, Sometimes they fit a machine gun there, and the idea is the infantry are in the back, they are carried to where the fighting is going on, and then they jump out the rear, or debus as it's called, to finish the attack on foot. Um, so the military sometimes calls these vehicles battle taxis. They're not for fighting from, they're for delivering you to where the fighting is going on.